Welcome to Ear Biscuits, the podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at the round table of dim lighting, we're hearing about your near-death experiences. Yes. We're taking advantage of this line. We got this phone call line. This phone call line. A hotline. Man, I love it. I love people's eight, eight, eight. voices. Earpod one. I love people's voices. All you gotta do is call in when we put a prompt on the Twitter machine. Yeah, so, and these are literally- We have a Twitter machine. Near death experiences. And what I mean by that is, like, people almost died. And we they asked- nearly died. We asked for ones that were funny or bizarre. Specifically, and we got we got, and maybe maybe there's a serious one or two in there too. I am embarking on a journey. I'm making an investment. I'm learning something new. I am currently being trained to do something to be certified. Taekwondo and nope, and it could lead to a near death experience. It could lead to a death experience. Parachuting, but it could also lead to like an eye opening, heart opening. Life changing. Heart opening? Yeah. Future defining experience, relationship defining experience for me and a significant other in my life. Oh, I, really building this up. Yeah, so it, I think this is the right episode to, to let you know. You go, you're gonna start playing Magic the Gathering? No, nah, I'm open to it, but that's not it. I am learning to scuba dive, uh, I am be, I am becoming scuba I certified. Knew that. I was just playing dumb. Yeah. Um, ever since, and let me tell. I just want to tell you. I've been waiting to tell you about the process of training. Get but, get wet. But the thing, you know, back when we went on tour, we were in Australia. And we were like, you know what? When you're coming back from Australia, there, there's that there's that place called Fiji. Yeah, we might could as stop well fly there. over it. And we went scuba diving that one day. No, no we didn't. We went snorkeling. We, none of us are certified. And I had just a magical experience under the water, like swimming in the in the reef at in the tidal zone on this island that this boat took us to. And it was just like so meditative. I thought I was and I, I think I talked about it on the podcast yeah. as a highlight of that vacation years ago that I was Gonna cry in my mask. It you was can't just, do that because you'll die. It, no, it was just so awesome, and th that's when I started to think, man, I'd really like to scuba dive. And then I I start talking to Chase. You know, Chase is scuba certified. Well, okay, let so me, I'm having some conversations. Let me with interject him. because when you started talking about scuba diving, you talked about it in a way that there was a you. There seemed to be a heavy dose of fear involved, and every time you brought it up, it was like you were stepping across a precipice into like a gauntlet of sorts. Because so explain that. I have a fear of being underwater. <laughs> That's the problem. And ho specifically holding my breath. Like, I mean, I I jump in my pool and I go underwater, hold my breath. I'm swimming around. I, I'm like very much aware that there's this time are going off in my in my body that's like, if you don't get to the place where you can breathe air soon, you're gonna die. It's like, it's very, it's an immediate feeling for me. And well, it's, a, it's an important survival mechanism. But you, you know, and I always chalked it up to, I was never a pool boy. I was never, you were a pool boy. You went to the Keith Hills pool growing up, did a lot of swimming. I did very little swimming in a pool environment where you like hold your breath and you get comfortable holding your breath. You're mostly swimming ba around. bathtub swimmer. Yeah, I'm, or like a river swimmer, and you don't you don't spend a lot of time on you. You're more of wading and treading water. No ocean swimming. Not a lot. I mean, ocean. It's more like your body surface and stuff like that. You're on the surface. You're not. I didn't do a bunch of like. Oh, the diving in the ocean. That's like, the fun part. When I would go to freaking the Keith Hills pool with for the pool parties. They would do that thing where everybody would cross the pool, cross the pool, and be one guy in there trying to tag you, mm -hmm. and you and a bunch of other people could just dive in, swim to the very bottom of the pool, and come up on the other side and never get tagged. And here I am, like flailing around on. <laughs> I can swim, but 
Something about being underwater. You're not a submarine. Man. My mom is afraid of swimming. As a kid, she dove into a pool and hit her head, and then she never swam again. Well, maybe her DNA was altered when that happened, and it got passed to you somehow. That can happen, you know. DNA gets maybe that's altered what it is. by so events. I didn't. I didn't experience any trauma, but the Fiji snorkeling experience was so formative for me that I was like, I want to do this. I want to be able to go under that water and not have to come up. It's a great idea, and I'm and plus, I think I'm gonna have to overcome this fear. Mm. And then I tried to talk Christy into it; she wasn't going for it, uh, but Lincoln was up for it. I was like, Lincoln, we're going, we're planning this big trip to Hawaii. I was like, dude, we're gonna scuba dive in Hawaii. And he was like, all right, yeah, I'll do it with you. This is, this is also uh, maybe the the plot of White Lotus. Did that did that enter into your uh yeah the the the, the teenage father, the teenage yeah they actually did it's that like, let's too. get scuba certified man well I I'd made up my mind before then but did then that I, put you over the top? I didn't put any plans in place and then when I watched White Lotus I was like I'm gonna put these plans in place see how this teenager's life was changed like he found his calling in the ocean spoiler oh well it's not, a nice storyline really. but I wouldn't no. call it a spoiler. I mean, you're the one who's sensitive to spoilers, I'm just joking. And so I said, all right, I'm gonna do this. Started talking to Chase about the process. He made a recommendation to Hollywood Divers. Shout out to Hal and the team that I'm, I I linked up with. You, you gotta take an online course. Because Lincoln and I were doing it together, it took a number of months for us to get through it. You watch a video, you read some stuff, you answer some questions. If you don't get it right, you gotta answer all the questions again, but there's like five questions at a time. And it, I mean, it was probably cumulatively over three hours worth of stuff. And then at the end, there's like a 70 question test. I'm like, Lincoln, you're, dude, you're, you're used to taking tests. You show up and go to school any day of the week. You're, you're like, all right, another test. Last test I took was a freaking driving test when I moved to California. Before that, when's the last test I took? Like, it's, test taking is a skill. So I was like, man, I'm gonna be out just because a freaking, I don't even know how to take tests. Like, I don't know how to retain information. Did he beat you on the test? Um, I let him take the 70 question test a little bit ahead of me and he's moving fast. I'm like, how are you moving so fast? You're gonna get these wrong, you're gonna fail. And then he he passed with like a 73. And then it showed him all of his uh, answers and I was like, well, let me stroll over okay. here. Oh no. Just let me, you know, let, I, I don't wanna, just I just wanna like see if what I'm thinking is the right answer you're, is. You're, what your you're, certification is about to be stripped from you, sir. I'm just saying, well, I, of course I didn't do it. I just thought about it. Okay, all right, thanks for clarifying. I didn't go over there and actually verify that his answers agree with mine. But I bet you that they did, what'd if you, I would have what, checked. What'd you get on the test? A 91. Uh, okay, well, okay, <laughs> it helps to. It helps, you know what, I'm not even saying anything. <laughs> yeah, it just helps to be knowledgeable. I don't want you to be stripped of your license. But dude, I mean, they spend very, very, very little time in this course talking about how amazing scuba diving is. Matter of fact, there's, there's basically no part of the curriculum that says, remember how awesome this is. So by the time I got to the end of it, all I learned was that like, you can die in a million different ways, you can, you can maim, and your body and being all types of internal pain. I mean, the one thing that put me at ease was like, all right, I have a fear of holding my breath underwater. But one of the first things you learn in scuba class is never hold your breath. Yeah, you don't hold your breath, you're breathing the whole time. Because, not just because you have air, but because if you, the further you go down, the more pressure gets on your lungs. And if you hold your breath under pressure, and then you start to ascend, your lungs become a closed system when you're holding your breath, and then all those little it's like balloons, a paper bag. all those little balloons, the air inside starts to expand. Oh. Your freaking lungs explode. That's not good. Your freaking lungs explode. So you have to you have to have a discipline to be constantly breathing. How deep does that become an issue at? Uh, I don't know. They just tell they don't they don't want you knowing the exceptions, and maybe I did know, but I, I can't remember that. Like you, but not pool depth. Not in pool depth. <laughs> no, not like eight or ten feet. Okay. Um, don't ask me questions that then I'm like, 
Don't listen to any of well, my facts that I'm stating about well, scuba. The, the, the one thing I'm a little bit worried about is there's so many numbers involved and there's like math and there's calculations. Oh gosh, yeah, because you, all this, you got all this nitrogen. And your life depends your, on it. You get, you get this nitrogen that has to off gas and so depending on how deep you are, you have to do all these calculations and keep all these records. You're gonna need a laminated chart like they how, make for uh, the gut check episodes that you take down and dive with. Either that or like a dive computer that does it all for you. But if that you have exists? to do, yeah. Get that. I can rent one of those, but if you have to, but it's it's really, okay, I can't dive past like 60 feet for more than an hour. I'm just throwing out numbers here. But then if you wanna go You're on You're gonna a, be 60 feet under the water. How does that make you feel? Well, I'll tell you how it made me feel when I did the next level of training. But yeah, they're talking about like, you got all this nitrogen in your in your body and it has to off gas and it will accumulate over time. So if you don't wait 24 hours after a dive, you have to calculate how deep you can go for how long in any subsequent dives, in the, like in the same 24 hour period. Think of all the people who learned this the hard way. Yeah, so you don't come up to, and you don't get the bends. Um, and then the- Is that a TikTok dance? It's 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 the name of an album. Yeah. You then move to the next phase, which is um, you get training in a pool. So we did this at our pool. It was it was just me, Lincoln, and Matt and Ray were doing that. They were supervising. The two of them were supervising our our training. And so we spent like four and a half hours in my pool this past weekend learning how to dive. With, it, with with the with the breathing apparatus and the yeah, tanks and it, everything, the full kit and caboodle. You like wet, rent it. wetsuit? Oh yeah, wetsuit and everything. Wetsuit, hood, boots, gloves, everything that I'm going to have for the next phase, which is going into the open ocean water certification, which is two days. I'm doing that this coming weekend. Oh gosh, I think I am. It's nice knowing you. So this past weekend, we get in the pool and they're like, first of all, it's like even snorkeling when you put your face under the water. Like everything in your being is telling you, don't breathe. I mean, you're underwater, do not breathe. That's why you can throw a baby in the water. Yeah, it's in, it's instinct that you have to overcome, that you have to start breathing underwater. And it's pretty nerve wracking. I mean, if you've ever snorkeled, there's like that moment of acclimation that's like, oh, I'm yes, body, mm. you can do this. Chill out, brain, you can do this. Then you put on the regulator, like, yeah, yeah, you you have, it's an amazing system that you're putting this vest on that then it connects to the tank behind you as well as you having a regulator that you breathe the, breathe the air out of the tank and a backup octopus regulator that you can share with somebody in an emergency or use yourself. Or share with an octopus. <laughs> they don't need it. Um, but then there's also a hose that you hook to the vest because you wear this vest and you put weights in it. Depending on how much you weigh, you've gotta be able to sink. So you weigh yourself down, even more than just the tank and the vest, just ballast. And that's how you get back up. You fill the vest with more air. Yes, you have a you have this trigger over here. I always you, wondered about that. Instead of breathing the air in, it pressurizes, it's pressurized and it fills up your vest like a PFD. And you can fill it up, psh, a little bit at a time. And it's so interesting and that- And then you can let it out. When it goes into your vest, so you got the pressurized you know, mixture, whatever is in there, and then when it goes into the vest, it creates a buoyancy that wasn't a force that was existing when it was pressurized. That's crazy. Yeah. I, I didn't know about this. I always kind of thought that they like dropped weights or something. I knew they didn't, but like that's, I don't like, how do you get back up? Yeah, air, the, the, the air mixture, which there's, you know, the air we breathe is mostly nitrogen. Yeah. And so that's why when you're down at depth, I can't, you know, you're, the nitrogen uh, content in your body increases. Do you have to like dial in what the mix is? No, no, no. It's all predetermined. Yeah, it's just, it's a tank. You breathe out of it. Okay. You suck it down. So yeah, there's this, the thing that we had to learn was Getting in the pool, I mean everything. How do you put on fins without killing yourself? How do you how do you put on your goggles, you know, in a way that and then they, fall back into the water? Is that what you did? Did well, you we walk the into the, the pool. pool? We did one of those like long step into the pool, but we didn't do the like backflip off the side of a, a dinghy into the You'll do pool. that next time. You'll do that this weekend. That's the one thing that I don't I, I don't know. I'm not I Oh you're like, that. I don't want to do the backflip thing. <laughs> 
But over the course of the four hours, it's like the first thing to do is, all right, you're gonna start breathing underwater. Let's go down and sit on the bottom of the pool. And and you know, they say breathe constantly, you gotta you've gotta like breathe calmly in and out. You don't and then I get down in there and I'm just starting to breathe. And yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of you have to like suck the air out of the tank a little bit. It kind of feels that way. Like it's a it's a restricted flow of air. It's not just like breathing air right here, right now. There's a little resistance. You gotta coax it out. And then your brain is still telling you, this is this is not a good idea. This is a bad idea. This is a life ending idea to breathe down here under this water. Don't do it. And so at a certain point, very early on for me, that, that sensation started to creep back in. Mm. And then he's like, come up, telling me thumbs up, so I come back up. And he could like, tell? No, he's like, how you doing? I'm like, I'm doing pretty good, it's taking an adjustment. He's like, you guys are doing great. Now we're gonna fill up your mask halfway with water and I'm gonna teach you how to get all the water out of your mask without coming up for air, yeah, this is without awesome. coming up to the surface. I mean, basically you have to learn everything that could go wrong or make you uncomfortable or need adjustment that you can fix it without giving in to the urge to try to come up to the surface. Cause again, you're 30, 60 feet down. You're not, you have to get rid of this notion of, well, I gotta go to the surface to take care of this. Right. No, 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 you gotta, you gotta take care of it right there. So. How's Lincoln doing at this point? Better than me. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. And so, filled a, he, he taught us how to clear the mask but we go into water, he points at me and he like does a mask sign, like fill up your mask with water. So I like, you seal the top of the mask. Well, first of all, you let air, you let water in the top of the mask. You just kinda like take it off and then it fills up with water. You can fill it up halfway if you wanted to kind of ease into it. Then you put the mask back on, you're like, okay. Now you seal the top of the mask against your forehead and you, you look up towards the surface and you raise the bottom of the mask out and blow, and then you blow out of your nose, yeah. which of course is part of the mask. And then the air from your nose fills up the top of the mask and down, 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 forcing all the water out. And then you can put the mask back on. It's a freaking magic trick. Well, Did you know this? I didn't know it, but before you explained it, I would have guessed that that's what you did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you but know. you've never done it. When you've snorkeled, you've never done it. No, because like, I haven't been, yeah, I mean, yeah, I haven't. Cause you can come up to the surface yeah. and clear. I mean, we also had to learn to clear your snorkel and st stuff I didn't know. But the first time I did that, like my mask is filled up with water. I'm opening my eyes in my pool. I'm like, I don't like to open my eyes in my pool. And then I'm like, oh, I forgot to breathe. And then I take a big deep breath. I'm like, <gasps> and then like my lungs are filled with air and I breathe out just a little bit. <gasps> and then I breathe in again. And all of a sudden I'm like, Having this, why are you making panic. me panic by telling your story? Like you're in the because pool. It was freaking scary because I was like, I packed my lungs with air, and I just felt like I kept trying to pack more air in there, and I started panicking. <laughs> and then it's like I had to come up, and then I was I I you know <gasps> took a breath at the surface, and then I was like, all right, I gotta I gotta get this under control. I gotta calm down. I'm not, and I talked to my instructor about it and like he gave me some tips about like make sure you breathe out empty your lungs like you breathe out all the way before you start breathing in again and i just had to start telling myself as long doesn't matter what happens with your mask or anything like that as long as you're breathing you can handle everything else and you don't need to get worked up here stay calm it's 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 a meditative exercise of discipline to train your brain and your instincts to turn off in certain ways and to stay chill. Because, you know, even if you start breathe, sucking down a lot of air, it's just gonna limit the amount of time you're able to enjoy your dive anyway, because you're gonna run out of air. Or or die from panic. <laughs> so I, I got, gotta say, I'm I got, a little worried about you. I got used to that, and then he's like, now we're gonna lose your regulator. You're gonna lose the thing that you're that is keeping you alive. You're gonna lose the, the hose. And then he taught us how to find it and put it back in our mouths and like that was scary because like now I am holding my breath. He's like, don't hold your breath. You have to be breathing out constantly. So I'm breathing out, oh, okay. assuming that I'm gonna find the regulator to so, put back in my mouth. Okay, 
So you're saying that you can't hold your breath at any point because even if even if you're you not te- moving vertically, you technically can. But it, when you're learning, you need to ha- develop a discipline of constantly breathing, just it's, so you don't forget. Make it a reflex. Yeah, kind of thing. yeah, and like because when you're panicking and if you have to do an emergency ascent to the surface, I'm gonna keep it coming. Out. You have to keep your lu- your airway open by breathing out so that your lungs don't explode. So we did that and and like put in a regulator and then it's like practice losing your regulator and then using your backup regulator. And now it's like, all right, now let's practice the symbol for I'm out of air, which is like slitting your own throat symbol. And so then it's like Lincoln and I had to rescue each other underwater by sharing our air Ew. with the other guy. Gross. From the, now you keep your regulator in your mouth but you've got a backup that you haven't used. The one for the octopus. That you put. Yeah, the octopus, you put on the other guy and you link up and you do the hand signals like you're okay and then you ascend. Hold on, was that white power? No, okay. Okay, I'm just making sure. The okay symbol is thumbs up does not mean okay. Thumbs up means go to the surface. And I did not learn any racist (laughs) symbols. I'm just making sure. I don't know this company that you're dealing with. I just, I'm just trying to look, I'm just looking out for everything. Thank you. It's like. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I made sure that I wasn't working with a racist scuba company. Good, that's, it is important. That's I mean, just as important as not dying. And then we had to uh, practice rescuing someone who's potentially dead at the bottom. Wow, who got to do that? Ray played dead at the bottom of the pool, oh, and then he's each done of this. this is Ray's favorite part. Ray uh, Ray is a she. You know, think like Star Wars. Oh, R E Y. R E Y. Yeah. Mythical Beast too, turns out. Oh wow. Yeah. She told me that after I saved her life a couple of times. First <laughs> first time I saved her life, I got a cramp in my calf and I just let her go and I and I went into like fix my cramp mode. And then when I, and then I had to retrieve her from the bottom again. Is there a symbol for cramp? Uh no, there's just a technique. You grab the end of your fin and pull it towards your knee to stretch it out. Okay. And then I got her up and I was like, hey, listen, I if you were already dead, I'm at least gonna handle my cramp. She's like, actually, you did the right thing. You're supposed to take care of yourself before you. Yeah, it's like being on a plane. Yep, before you take care of somebody Oxygen else. Oxygen to yourself. So it's like all of this, like, learn to just stay cool, honey bunny, no matter what happens, because you're gonna be underwater, and you ain't you ain't gonna not be underwater. And if you're, and if you're panicking and sucking down air, it's like you have to learn. <sighs> so by the end of five hours, he was like, you guys are gr- you guys are fast learners. We're gonna go out to Catalina. We're gonna spend two days in the open water. You're gonna get your certification. And I'm thinking sharks. I'm thinking I don't, I don't care about sharks. I'm not afraid of sharks. Okay, I'm just letting you know they'll be out there. Some people are that. I'm not that. I'm just afraid of suffocating. Okay. Right. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. But I kept the equipment in between. Oh, last so weekend. you're com- contemplating not going because of like your the first time I panicked. I, that I told you about, I definitely had a thought of, I can't do this. <laughs> like, I've, we've already booked our our trip to go out to Catalina to be, get certified. We've already booked our trips in Hawaii. Like, I've really built this up. I, I just can't. You can't back out now. I can't do it. And then I'm like, I can't back out now. It's like, this in and of itself is a test. I can do this. I just need to chill out. And that was like in, you know, the first, 30 minutes, like the first time I was breathing underwater. So it got better. I can only imagine how harrowing your story is going to be when you leave the pool. <laughs> I know, man. You, I don't think, you you would not have any trouble with this. And I asked Lincoln last night, I was like, dude, were you panicking at any point? He was like, that one time you mass filled up with water, you did shoot to the surface. He was like, yeah, but after that I was totally cool. I no, was like, you're too young to think about dying. The, the main re- the main issue I would have is the issue that I have while snorkeling is my beard. And people say, oh, you put the silicone stuff or whatever, but like I, I've tried it and my mask leaks and you know me, I'm not losing the beard. No, just all you'd have to do is shave your mustache. Yeah, you know me, Amish Rhett. You would have to be Amish. And when I, if I make a commitment to the Amish lifestyle, I'll become a scuba diver, but that might be a conflict. I don't know if they believe in that technology. Last night, I said, Lincoln, let's get back in the pool and practice one more time. There's some air left in our tanks. And we got in, I spent probably an hour and a half in the pool last night, take it, like losing my regulator, holding my breath underwater, and like, well, breathing out 
while I try to recover my my air supply and just laying at the bottom of the pool and just trying to put myself in that mental space of if you get worked up, just breathe, just calm your breathing. So I feel more comfortable after doing that and I also know now what it feels like to for to run out of air because I I practiced until literally the the tank was empty mm. which is, that's a scary feeling. So I go up to Lincoln and I'm like mine ran out before his and I'm like doing the symbol and like he's like we actually did it. It's like I took his huh. and we but like it's a scary feeling when you're you're sucking your air and it's like it's getting more difficult and then all of a sudden it's like how, uh, <coughs> do, is there any, any sort of warning? No, you just have a gauge. Well, there's a gauge. There's a gauge that you're constantly monitoring. But I've forgotten totally about why I got into this. So I'm trying to get back into that space and I hope when I go to Catalina that like it's gonna be a beautiful experience that's gonna be like, yes, this is why I was doing this because all I've been thinking about is worst case scenarios. Well, it's not gonna be Fiji, just so you understand that. Like yeah, I mean, he said he said there could I, be. I've, I've seen like beautiful videos from people who have uh, dove around Catalina, but it it's not Fiji. You were like in an aquarium, yeah. Like a be, like yeah, I know. it's not going to be that great. So, and I I've just kind of talked about like all of the stuff that's made me really scared, but I'm but I'm balancing that with the experiences that I'm going to have with my son and with nature. So he's not nervous. Not nervous, no. So he's a good buddy. I was like, Lincoln, if I'm if I start doing this like Zen breathe in, breathe out symbol with my hands, it means that I'm panicking. Don't try to get me to do anything else. Just come over and just like Is that smile. Part of the training? No, that's something I developed. Oh, okay. Maybe maybe they'll add it to the curriculum. Man. So We'll get to your near death experiences, but I got to talk about dispatches from Myrtle Beach. Yeah. I don't have we talked about dispatches from Myrtle Beach on this show? Not on this I show. We... we talked about it on GMM. Yeah, this we, week. we've announced it. Um, and I just, I mean, I just listened to the uh, the trailer, which is out um, for this podcast, which is Charles Neal and Link Neal. That's Link's dad. Uh, and let me just tell you, I mean, I'm very excited. I know that you've already recorded an episode. Yeah. Um, but I mean, when, when. Well, it comes out this Thursday. When you just, I mean, your dad. Or last Thursday, your if dad's you're voice, watching the video version. Your dad's voice is iconic, and now we are, we're monetizing it. He has been so excited. Once I started talking <laughs> to him about doing a podcast, and I'm like, Dad, this is, your podcast, and I'm just like your sidekick. I'm here to, I'm mean, just here to talk to you and catch up every week. Every Thursday, we're gonna publish our conversation where we catch up, but there's gonna be, we have different segments planned, different things that he's gonna talk about. Um, so yeah, he's driving the ship, and I, I'm, I'm an interesting passenger on this journey of what is this, what is this gonna, is this gonna become something? It, and I think it really comes down to is it is it gonna become something in my dad's mind and in his life? Like if is this gonna legitimately be an outlet for him? Like so far, he's got hundreds and hundreds of emails from people ever since way back when I, I tweeted his email address, people didn't believe me. And then he's like elated to be getting so I got three hundred emails. He's about to get in more in one night. He's about to get more. Yeah. Rather be shagging fifty three at AOL dot com. <laughs> It's his email address. So yeah, every Thursday, wherever you get your podcast, Dispatches from Myrtle Beach, my dad has a podcast where he talks to me. So go over there and uh, subscribe and follow whatever you can do, even though an episode's not out if you're listening to this. But if you're watching the video, the episode's up. The first episode's up, you can go and actually listen to it right now, wherever you get your podcast. The things that we talked about in the first episode, uh, I ended up giving him quite an education. Of course, he. I learned some things about him too. I don't. I don't want to give anything away. I just want you to go over there. I'm excited about this. I haven't listened to. It. I'm going to listen why. to it as a uh, as, as a, a fan con, of Charles as a, as a consumer. You yeah. know what I'm saying? 
We're trying to keep the episodes at like 30 minutes. So it's like, it kind of feels a different niche in your like listening routine than say your biscuits. So yeah. Hmm. Thursdays, dispatches from Myrtle Beach. Let's start with uh, hearing a near death experience. So this is actually a very American story. I almost choked to death on a corner of a hot sauce packet while eating lunch at work. Oh. I uh, That's not had it. ripped it off and okay. I guess I didn't throw it away properly and it somehow made its way into my sandwich and when I tried to swallow, it got stuck in my esophagus or whatever it is that blocks, you know, stuff that isn't supposed to be going into your stomach. Well, you, oh no, it and blocked your wimp. I was I all alone. I had my own office and no one was around. I had a walkie talkie, but couldn't use it because I couldn't speak because I was choking. And I had no clue what to do. I ended up trying to dig it out of my throat. It didn't quite work. Uh. And I uh, ended up just trying to make myself throw up. And uh, that did work. So I did not die. And I lived to tell the tale. But that's the story of me being American and <laughs> almost choking to death on something that could have been prevented if I had just not been so hasty while I was eating. Thanks for sharing your story. But there's a couple of, I just can't believe this happened. I mean, the, typically the corner of a hot sauce packet is not a chokeable size. It depends on it depends on how good of a rip you get and how deep it goes, I think. And if it just went into the windpipe, she said esophagus, but. Tra you know, trachea, yeah, trachea and, and esophagus, right? They say so get, they meet. It must have been at a spot where, cause, cause making yourself throw up, it's gonna bypass your windpipe if it's gone deep enough. Well, it was probably like, right there at the intersection of the two. Hey. Uh, and 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 I don't know. I'm no no doctor, but I think that if something is like lodged right there at the top of the trachea, it's more than anything. It's super. It's super unpleasant. But if you yeah. were to stop and not not cough, you would find that you're still able to, especially in this case, get oxygen into your lungs. Now, I'm not a doctor either, yeah. but my understanding but is- you've you, taken that scuba test. You do not give someone the Heimlich maneuver if they're making noise, because that means that there is some sort of air flow. Well, if they're like, if they're beating a table, that's noise, just to clarify. If there's no noise coming, right. <laughs> it's like, you must be silent. If they're, Calm down and don't say a word or make a sound before I do the Heimlich. If they're coughing, and yeah, making if it, noise. If there's still air coming from their lungs in some capacity. Right, then there's not a complete blockage. And it won't work, it'll just break their ribs or whatever. Again, not a doctor, this is not medical advice. In the event of choking, go to Google and figure out what you're supposed to do. <laughs> or do that right now and then be ready for when it happens. The American part of it, like. Hot said, sauce packet. So Americans are associated with hot sauce packets? I mean, I'm sure they've, they've ventured out beyond America, but it, you know, I think that it was like this super convenient little pack of something in this disposable thing, you know, it's a, it, feels, it feels very American. It's interesting that it was in the sandwich and that's the foreign object in the sandwich is what made her choke, but any part of the sandwich could have made her choke. But she knew it was the hot sauce. I guess so. The hot sauce packets, I mean, it's gonna grab on in a way that food's yeah. not gonna grab on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm this not is, a doctor. This is disturbing. Let's go to another one. Hi, Rentlink. Hey. My name is Jacqueline, and my near-death experience was when my boyfriend at the time, who is now my husband, left me alone at his apartment complex. And while I was there, I heard a really loud chainsaw noise, and it was so loud. And I heard girls outside my apartment screaming bloody murder. And I thought there was a chainsaw man on the loose. I even chainsaw filmed man. it. I have a video of myself wondering where the chainsaw was coming from. And I, in the moment, did not think to call the police or do anything rational. But I ran out of the apartment without my shoes on, down three flights of stairs, jumped into my car, and drove and parked in the nearest Piggly Wiggly parking lot. Um, when I got back after sobbing, thinking I almost died from a chainsaw attack, I found out it was a man doing donuts on his motorcycle in the parking lot. And <laughs> I literally thought I was going to get chainsawed to death. So that was my near-death experience. 
Thank man you. doing donuts. Yeah, I think she was a chainsaw man, man doing donuts. <laughs> I will say, <laughs> I think the Piggly Wiggly parking lot is maybe not the safest place on the planet. I, I mean, I no, I, I just, I mean, I think there's, I, I listen, not a sponsor. I hope maybe Piggly Wiggly will sponsor us at some point, but just based on my Piggly Wiggly parking lot experiences, you know what? Being at home is probably safer. Yeah, I've watched a Piggly Wiggly burn to the ground before. That one in Lillington. You were present for that? Yeah. I just walked over to the edge of Nana and Papa's neighborhood and sat on a berm and just watched it burn. You're joking. Ah, don't you remember when that happened? I remember hearing about it, but yeah. I didn't see it. I remember driving by afterwards. You know, typically when somebody, like arsonists, this is the type of thing they do. Yeah, look at that little teenager sitting on a berm watching it Piggly Wiggly burn. <laughs> Suspect number one. <laughs> the chief of police grandson. Yeah, it all adds up. <laughs> well, hold on, did you burn it down? I didn't. For the record, I did not burn the Piggly Wiggly down. Who do you think somebody did? Was I, it was it arson? Uh, no, it wasn't arson, as far as I recall. We had a lot of arson in our parts. Cha hearing a chainsaw and immediately thinking of a chainsaw man is, uh, you know, that well, that's kind screams. of a leap. The screams, though. The screams, yeah. That's scary. And and now that. Now that we do understand what was happening and it was a donut man, not a chainsaw man. Doing donuts. Were the screams screams of glee? Yeah. Cause that's a good way to get a Harnett County woman excited. I don't yeah, know what this was. In a Piggly Wiggly parking lot, there's no way to get a woman more, <laughs> more excited more quickly. Can you do a donut? Yeah. Now it does remind me of um, Lincoln's gotten into manga yeah. and he was reading, I was like, let me let me look at this one that you're reading. He was like, okay. It's called Chainsaw Man. Whoa! And huh. it's this, and I just started flipping through the book. And he's like, first of all, you're flipping backwards. It's, it's, it's you, you gotta know. start from the back. You gotta start from the back, Dad. And I was like, well, spoiler alert. It's the most disturbingly well illustrated, disturbing scenes I've ever seen. Like. Like the, the 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 creatures, there's this creature called Santa Claus that has nothing to do with Santa Claus. That then like is an amalgamation of all of these things that it like uh, starts to control, like baby doll heads that turn into that like they group into like the legs of a spider creature that is oh, walking around. Oh, it's like around. one of those. What do we call it? We, the things where you you just have a eyeballs and hair. Oh. You love this type of stuff. You would really be into it. But the chainsaw you can man have one of those. is a guy that I don't know what triggers it. Uh, it's a very famous uh, manga, written and illustrated by Tatsuki Fujimoto. So this is, it's in Japanese, so he's just looking at the pictures? Or is it translated? I think it's translated. I was just looking at the pictures. There's, it's mostly pictures. So then when they translate it, they don't also flip it. But the chainsaw, no, the chainsaw man it's like when he turns into Chainsaw Man, ch a chainsaw comes out of his head and out of his hands and it destroys his body as he's transforming and it's very grotesque. Quite a sacrifice. It's very grotesque and there's a, um, there's, a there's, there's a video series that's coming out. Well I hope so. He's very excited about it. I was like, I don't know if I can watch that with you. It's that I, stuff what, is what, scary. What man. is it like to have, to be a child and have a dad who is the one that gets scared of scuba diving and manga? It's scary. What is man. that going to do for him? It's as legitimately he as he grows disturbing. Up? I was like, son, doesn't this disturb you? I think he's in the wrong. I was like, yeah, if this doesn't disturb you, no, it's cool, man. Like, oh, it's, it's cool. Just, it's troubling to me. It's troubling to me. But I'll watch it with him. I'll give it a shot. Hey guys, my name's Amber and about four years ago during a nice thunderstorm, I went outside to record the water coming down the road. There was a light, there was like, there was a lightning strike really close and I don't remember much, but I ran inside and watched the video back to see that it was like right next to me and slowing it down frame by frame is even scarier and I haven't been out during a thunderstorm since. Uh, I still have the video if y'all wanna see it too and I don't really know if it's considered near death, but uh, it was definitely scary. So yeah, thanks, bye bye. Well, we're watching the video, and I can tell you right now, yeah, this is near death. Turn the sound on to Amber's video. Minji. At Minji Poo. M E N J I E Poo with two O's. Okay. 
all this water. Guys, it's awesome. We can freaking tube down. <laughs> all this water. Guys, it's awesome. We can freaking tube down. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> all this water. What? Water. I like the way she said that. I, obviously, she's just being down funny, but Amber. Amber was so excited about the ability to tube down that creek ditch. Wow. Good lord. I mean, so see if you can. It lights up like half the screen. Go, go back to there and kind of do the frame by frame thing she was talking about. I don't know if you can do that with Twitter, but basically, oh, like whoa. I mean, it phases out the the camera on the. But look, it's like lighting up the whole. It's pink. It's very pink. Wow. That's crazy. That is crazy. And she she screamed at the same time it hit. <laughs> water. <laughs> I'll just water. <laughs> Amber, oh, we like wow. how you say water. Thank you, Amber. <laughs> uh, and then she said, uh, I left a voicemail and I think I talked too fast. No, I li we like it when you talk no, fast. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Keep it short. Keep it, keep it sweet. Wow. Yeah, man. Cause I glad you're okay. Amber. I think that I miss thunderstorms. I seem to remember like the baddest, scariest thunderstorms happened when we were at church on like a Wednesday night. There'd be like there'd be pink lightning. You know, you got that pink lightning only man. at church. I just have those memories. Yeah, they happen quite a bit. Hi, Rhett and Link. My name is Jacob, and I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. Yo. And my near-death experience happened on the second week of my freshman year at college at Western Carolina University up in Cullowhee near Asheville. Mm -hmm. A group of friends and I went up to a waterfall one Saturday, and I was not being particularly wise as I was walking on some rocks on top of a waterfall. So, of course, I slipped, and I fell on my stomach down one small waterfall and then another, until I fortunately landed in a pool deep enough to stop me about a small car's width from a 50 foot drop to just a pile of rocks. Uh, to make matters worse, the pool I landed in was full of leeches and they were all over my legs, all the way up my swimsuit. Oh. And one last thing, I was with a group of friends from a campus ministry I was in at the time. I have a similar deconstruction story to y'all's. Oh. And the He's guy that helped here. pick the leeches off my legs kept complaining about how weird it was and how uncomfortable it made him. So that was a great Saturday. <laughs> yeah, that, that getting a little homoerotic there, a little uncomfortable for the. <laughs> is, that, is that what was happening? I didn't think it was, it was just like, oh, I don't no, know. No, I just kinda think pulling leeches off somebody is weird. I don't know, is, is spirituality aside, like belief system aside. I think, uh, my he understanding was, was why he would made the connection is the guy was a little uncomfortable with getting close to his junk or something. Dude, freaking going off of a water, you gotta be freaking careful, man, if you're like hanging out around a waterfall and if you're in the water that then starts to, eventually falls, it's just not a good practice. You don't wanna be in pre-water fall water, you know? Yeah, and. It just seems like a, a something to live by. Well, the most I don't swim in pre waterfall water. The most uh, visceral this has has ever been for me was when we went we visited Niagara Falls, and so there's been plenty of times in my life when I've been like in a creek or in a river that had a waterfall, and you're like kind of swimming, and you're like I'm, I'm not going to go there because it's a waterfall. Yeah, there was one time we were we were swimming in Yosemite when I was a kid. Like, I mean, I remember this very clearly because. My dad was like, there's a waterfall down there. And then years later, we heard about people who would be swimming in Yosemite and get swept down and go off a giant waterfall and die. Yeah, the year that I was there, we hiked to the top of Yosemite Falls and they, they were doing a helicopter rescue of someone who had gone over the falls. Yeah, but when we went to Niagara Falls, when we visited Niagara Falls with our wives. Yeah. Uh, and we, we were on the, we were on the Canadian side, right? Which is the better side. Mm -hmm. Not nothing against America, but just it's a it's a it's a cooler side. More of, picturesque, I believe. Of of the uh the river. It's crazy. Like you can get right down there next to I mean you can't really if I remember correctly, you can't like walk to it or whatever if you're just a you know, a, a civilian. <laughs> but obviously you don't want to go off Niagara Falls. And just the other day I saw a video going around. I think on Twitter, and it was the guy who cuts the grass 
What? At above the falls, and he's got a rope tied to him. <laughs> so like the person who's like he, mowing he, the grass. Is he on a riding lawnmower with a rope attached? In my mind, he had a push mower because it was like kind of like, uh, it, it was a place you didn't want to be like on a vehicle that could fall in. It was just like, okay, I'm kind of mowing the grass here. Oh wow! And I'm and I'm and I'm buckled in. Here we go. There you go. There he is, right there. <laughs> dude, dude using a push mower, and he's got like this giant. Yeah, that makes sense. Harness around him, and a sleeveless shirt. Well, you don't want to be weighed down. I think he's just wearing. That's a mo job I don't want. You know, really, yeah, extra challenging though. That's beautiful though. That's advanced mowing. People go, yeah. There was the person who drove their car, and was like the car with the person in it was like close to the edge of Niagara Falls, like a couple, few months ago, and they had to do a rescue to get the person out of the car. They were in the water. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I guess if your car I don't is know up if they there, were con- don't, I don't think they get, were conscious. Don't get out of your car because then you're, you're you're in serious trouble. Good gracious! I mean, you yeah, but imagine going over a waterfall, landing in a pool. And then struggling, but then Jacob went over again, landed in a second pool, and then he f- finally got it together. Because if he'd have gone over that third one, he'd he would have been he'd have been in a thousand pieces, man. Well, and then yeah, pool full of leeches and an uncomfortable moment with a friend. Man, my bizarre near death experience mm-hmm. happened when I had to get foot surgery on my big toe. They thought it was a, a bone infection or something like that. Um, so went in for the surgery at an outpatient center, uh, proceeded to apparently go into anaphylactic shock on the table, um, allergic to some of the medications they gave me to, for the surgery. I woke up, was told about it, um, and I was the outpatient center's first code blue ever. So that is my bizarre near death experience that my big toe tried to kill me. Dang, I mean, that's it's, scary. Because right? this is a group of doctors who are not accustomed necessarily to dealing with. Outpatient, yeah. You know, code blue. <laughs> yeah, it's like we're just gonna take care of your toe. I mean, it just makes me think, every time they ask me, if, are, are you allergic to anything? It's just like I always brush it off. Of course not, pollen. When I was little, my mom would say, He's he's allergic to amoxicillin because as a as a as a baby he had a a little reaction to it. But then at a certain point I just stopped saying that. Well, like, when was the last time you had antibiotics? I don't know. Ye- many years. Cuz I mean there's still there's Maybe still a big years. class of antibiotics. I mean it might be worth finding out. But y- y- usually what will happen is you're not going to die like You'll be in like the first or second day of taking them usually, and then you'll be like, like this happens to Jesse. She'll be like, oh, I'm reacting to this. Yeah. And then you just stop and get on another one. Um, That's, I, I, I had toe surgery, it's the only toe, this the only surgery I've ever had. When you broke your toe after the, the basketball tantrum? No, ingrown toenail. Oh, you got that? Uh, I had an ingrown toenail uh, in high school and went to the podiatrist. And still, the one of the to- I got some messed up toenails in general, but one of them on my big toe, like you can kind of tell that what they what they do is so that the t- there's one of my, one side of one of my big toes oh, no doesn't go under the skin. The nail doesn't like go. Uh, it doesn't like meet me, the skin. Is it, I mean, listen, it's one- you got to learn how to scuba dive, and you got to take this kind of stuff, man. And so they did something where they like cut it so that it would. And I was fully awake, and it was just like numbed or whatever. No code blues for me. But yeah, that's the one surgery I've had is toe surgery, big toe surgery. That's what we've got in common. It's so interesting to wake up from an outpatient s- surgery and they say, "Oh, you died for a second. It's like what? Like my toe died for a second? No, well, you died for a second. Is this is well. This is kind of crazy because for two reasons, two things that I've that I've been uh, looking into lately. The first is I just happened to see like a article yesterday and it was like a, a collection of people who woke up during surgery in their stories. God. See, I I wonder I wonder if we're gonna get the numbers back on this episode and be like, nobody clicked on, no one's listening to this episode because they're smarter than I am. 
No, that's the I thing. I didn't realize that I didn't want to hear this. Well, here's the thing. You don't like Chainsaw Man, but there's a market for it. Okay, I'm the market for it, and you, I'm p- speaking right now. Why, why do you? Why are you reading about people waking up during surgery? Because I have a fear of that happening. But but then why read about it? To know how bad it's going to be. To be prepared. So, like to, yeah, see, you're convinced it's going to happen. It to wasn't you. as bad as I. It was. I mean, there was a couple of people who were like, it was the worst pain I've ever experienced. Nothing has ever come close. But there was a couple of people who were like, I woke up. Everybody saw me. They gave me a little bit more of the juice, and I went back to sleep. I won't go into any more details about that, but the second thing I've been reading about. So you're telling me it made you feel better reading about those things. I felt the same. Uh, the second thing I've been reading about, and, I, and I'm interested, uh, I find it interesting that we didn't get any of these. And, and Daniel, is it that we didn't get any at all or that they're not in, the, in these ones that we're selecting from in terms of people who actually like saw something? Like saw the light? Saw the light. Okay. No one in the mythical beast community has seen the light. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that I am um, like go, I, I haven't gone hardcore like deep into this, but I've just, I'm finding myself um, reading about and like watching like documentaries about people's near death experiences and actually experiencing like out of body stuff. I mean, I still don't know what I think about it. I'm in an, I'm in an open place. Uh, is it like, okay, this is just something where there's like DMT released in your brain when you die and you feel like this is what's happening. Yeah. Um, but it's pretty fascinating how, I, I, was, I was actually hoping we would get some of those submissions based on some of the stuff I've been reading because they are relatively common and there's all these scientists, you know, people who had like a completely materialistic, naturalistic view of the world where they're like, consciousness is completely contained in the mind who basically began looking into this and were like, I can't in good conscience continue to believe that that's the case. It, it, something else must be going on with all these things that are happening to people. And of course, this is not anything new. People have been talking about this forever, but um, I don't know, it's a little intriguing. My granddad, um, so my mom's dad, you know, he passed away in 1996. Oh, I remember that. So in 19, uh, I mean, he had, Two separate open heart surgery procedures, like where they, you know, they split you open at least back then, from from sternum down, like down your thigh, like the the scar that he had is just like crazy. Why train did they tracks. go so deep? I don't know. It's um, like trying to open a book, and you really just got to. <laughs> you got to keep ripping it. <laughs> yeah, right. You keep rip. Like you got to stretch the the, the uh. spine out. Um, I don't. I actually don't know if it was related to one of the second one of those or something else. But I definitely remember sitting at the kitchen table after while he was recovering, and he said that he when he was under, and he. I don't remember if they said that he coded for any period of time. Like I, this is not the type of story that you want to go back to and like talk to relatives about uh, when you're just shooting the breeze. But he described going to a place that was like a ultra dark warehouse, like a real creepy, huge, dark warehouse. So like the opposite of going to the light. And I'm and he's telling me this story. And I'm thinking, man, my papa went to hell. He went to the hell warehouse. He went to is is, is that like the He went to like a, an abandoned Sam's Club. He said he was scared. He he said it scared the shit out of him. He started living right? He started living right. Yeah. No, I don't know. He, <laughs> his jokes were, were always very colorful. <laughs> <laughs> he kept saying fart blossom. <laughs> yeah, but I remember being concerned about his soul after he told me that. But he wasn't, that, that wasn't the implication when he was telling it. It was just kind of matter of fact, like this, this happened. Well. I was like, what do you do with this information? And it isn't. That, it seemed like not much. Well, based on what I'm seeing, there are things that are that people have in common, but the, but also it's not like everyone who is a professed Christian sees a light, and everyone who's not sees yeah. a dark warehouse or feels a little bit of heat. It's like <laughs> it isn't like oh no, this is supportive of a Christian worldview, but it is um, it's supportive of the fact that something happens when you get near the point of death, and I and I question if 
consciousness is completely contained physically in the mind, in the brain, and that there is no mind beyond that or any consciousness beyond that, like what is the evolutionary advantage of this release in this thing that happens at death? Like, I mean, of course, if you're, if you're essentially a, a computer and the computer is shutting down, some weird shit could happen in your mind that then if you come back from, the, if you actually reboot, some weird shit might be still in there, but. Maybe it's just a gift, you know? It's like the gift of existence is that when you're, when you're transitioning, as some people call it, or dying, as other people are calling it, uh, giving up the ghost, or however you want to say it, that there's like a there's a there's a little bit of a release of something that gives you a positive experience, yeah. ushers you out. But this is the thing that this is the thing that's so interesting, and we could do a whole episode on this. Maybe we will. Maybe we'll do a flatliners episode where we do it to ourselves. Maybe so you don't fight it as much, you know. But see, here's what I'm saying. So I don't want you to dismiss it if you're listening. The thing that it is they're not, they're no longer conscious, their brain stops functioning. This one woman was dead for 30 minutes, okay? Drowned and got like a kayaking accident. Okay, not, Pin, not scuba. Pinned underwater, under a water, she went over a waterfall in a kayak because somebody was in the way. This is like episode one of one of those Netflix series. She goes under the water, she's under the water. They, they, they basically after 15 minutes, it turns into a recovery operation, not a rescue operation because she's been in, underwater for 15 minutes. They eventually see her life jacket and a guy like is going to get it to be like, I'm, I think her husband would want this and she's attached to it. Whoops. Pull her out, she's blue, her eyes are fixed open, she's dead. I don't remember exactly how they got her to, they, they I think, uh, they like put her on top of a kayak. She was in Chile, I think, and she, uh, not a big bowl of Chile, the country Chile. And she, she they go up the uh, path and there's an ambulance there, like some serendipitous stuff happens. Anyway, she has all this stuff that happens where she saw, she basically saw all this stuff happen as she was like out of her body watching it happen. She was a very, per, she was a person of science. She was a doctor. She didn't believe any of this stuff. She didn't have any sort of supernatural paranormal disposition. Or enough kayak training. But she spent time with people who were very welcoming and like it felt awesome and warm and everything. And they told her, you have to go back. But they also told her basically that her son was going to die. And so she had this feeling, or it had been communicated to her that her son was gonna die, uh, and that he wouldn't make it past his 18th birthday. And he, it was like on his 18th birthday, he was in like a skiing competition, and she like goes to him the night before, and she's like, I've never told you this because I didn't wanna freak you out, but I don't believe you're gonna, I, th I think you're gonna die. And uh, he lives through the skiing competition. But then what? Two years later he dies. Oh. So they were off by two years? I don't know if they or, told her specifically that it wouldn't be until 18, but that's what, <sighs> anyway, so she like, her whole world view has changed and she's just one of like thousands of people who've had weird shit like this happen to them. Um, again, I don't know, I don't know. I well, I hate this episode. <laughs> Why are what? we doing this? But it's so interesting that you don't like it. All right, so I got a near death experience that's uh, pretty comical and. Uh, Good. Terrifying at the same time. Good. Oh, no. So me and my friends, we were hiking up Raven Cliff Falls it's down here in Georgia. You guys from North Carolina might have heard of it before. Nope, heard but of Georgia. We're hiking up the waterfall, and we've made it up the waterfall. We already stopped, so we're on the hike down, and I slip. I slip way up high on this uh, little mountainside. And I don't know how. Somebody up there might have been looking out for me. Not sure. Uh, but I was able to grab a hold of a tree and kind of maneuver my way back up. And, you know, I get two people come rushing out at me and they're like, are you okay? Like, what's going on? My friend's laughing, panicking. I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I don't, I don't realize how bad it was until later. And I'm brushing myself off. I, I continue walking, and we get down the cliff. And my friend that was with me, she, uh, she points up at the tree and goes, "That's what saved your life." I look up at that tree. And it's about a 200, 300 foot fall, 
from where that tree is. So that tree wasn't there. I probably would not be leaving this voicemail right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I became a tree hugger that day. <laughs> and I don't regret it. Love your show. Keep on keeping on and being your mythical best. Hey, that was good delivery, man, and especially the tree hugger part. That's tough, man. If you're gonna have a near death experience, it's better to not realize it until after the fact. Yeah, I that's do. the way I want to do it. Well, it might happen to you, man. You're stepping in. You're stepping at, into the gates of hell. No, it's just the ocean. Poseidon. And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna ease into it. You know, it's two days of being guided into like more comfort. It's gonna be fine. Link. Um, that re- that reminds me. Another thing that happened on that show is that there's a series of What's people. What's the name of the show? So you don't even know what it's called. Surviving Death. Okay. That's the name of it. But the other thing that they talked about, I'm only like two episodes in. It's not even new. It's been out for a while. Um, people falling great distances and having these like blissful experiences uh, While falling, it's kind of hard to understand exactly. I think it's they fell great distances and nearly died. Like there was an impact at some point, and but they look at that experience as like the best moment of their life because of what they experienced in some sort of like transition. Mm-hmm. So, but I mean, that can't happen to you in the water necessarily. But I'm sure something cool could happen to you. You could have a moment that you you could do a whole whole episode on. Hi, Rhett and Link and my fellow podcasters. Um, my name is Maddie, and living in the Beach South was absolutely nothing to do. Um, I've almost died a few times, but the funniest was definitely when my brother was given a, go- a go-kart for his eighth birthday, and little three-year-old me, um, he decided that we were going to go on a little trip um, on the field. And um, to his benefit of the doubt, he told me to hold on, and I did not and he took a very sharp left turn, and according to my dad and him, um, he turned left, and I did not. I, I was ejected from the, the cart, and I just started barrel rolling down the field of little three-year-old, and apparently my dad was sprinting towards me, um, and because I was just laying there lifeless, allegedly, that's what they thought. But I'm fine. So yeah, thanks, guys. Now go-kart. You, you you bought a go-kart for your children. Yeah. Um, let's see, it was, I mean, it was six years ago. I don't have it anymore, I sold it, because like, Lincoln was afraid to uh, drive it. It was like, it was a two-seater go-kart that like, my neighbor sold me because his kids had gotten older, and it had like a roll cage on it, and they wore helmets, and but like, Lincoln had had a bad experience riding the golf cart at my nanny's house, and like, he was riding it with uh, Lewis, and Lewis fell asleep in the golf in cart. In the gator? In, in the golf cart. Okay. And then what? And then Lincoln hit the bird bath, the cement bird bath, and then ran over oh, it and so got Lincoln stuck on it. Lincoln was driving, and his driving instructor fell asleep. Yeah, yeah. So he was scared to drive the go-kart that I bought. Kill any birds? Nope. No birds were bathing it, at the time. But that, that, bird, that bird bath stayed teetered over for, for quite a while. <laughs> um. Yeah, and then Lando was not was not his legs weren't long enough to drive it, so I got rid of it. But when I was a kid, w- w- uh, Jimmy got me and Emmy a go kart. Had no roll cage, no helmets, you know, two seater, and we would zoom around the house. And um, she she would be driving, and she would turn so sharply that the whole thing d- rolled. It like it didn't roll all the way over. It like teetered all the way up, and like dumped us out and then kind of landed on top of us. And it was like, you get out from underneath it and you're like, it's kind of like when you fall, you're like, did anybody see me fall? We're still good. We're still good. Turn that thing back over. Did you have any? You know, do you remember ever riding that go-kart? I don't think I drove that, at, go, at my house? that go-kart. Because my cousins had three wheelers. I mean, Those are dangerous. Like the first ATVs were three wheelers. Yeah. And they had a little one and they had a big one. And I remember going down there to South Georgia, going to their house, and of course they like just had this like, you know, like just woods and fields and stuff behind their house. And of course, 
no helmet, no shoes. <laughs> I just had on a pair of shorts and I'm like <laughs> six. No instructions. Living free, man. They just put you on the thing and then they're just like, this is how you go. Like they didn't even tell me how to stop, you know? Yeah. And and my parents are just like inside just drinking Cokes with, <laughs> with you know, with my aunt and uncle. Yeah. Like, it was just such a different time. And then my other cousins, they had a four wheeler. That's safer. Well, it doesn't like, roll as oh, easily. You can do two wheels on the front too. Same deal though. No, no helmets. Got to. I mean, boy, got away with so much. A lot of people weren't so lucky. Yeah, those those are accidents waiting to happen. Let's 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 pick one more. Wrap it up. Hi, Rhett and Link. Hey. My name is MemJ. At the beginning of 2021, I did something really stupid and nearly died when I had an accidental drug overdose. I stopped breathing, I couldn't move, but my thoughts were still really clear. Oh gosh. And in my mind, I saw my mom's face and I thought about how terrible this was gonna be for her. I saw my dog and I thought about how much I loved her. Oh. And the last thing I saw was Rhett and Link hey. <laughs> sitting behind the desk. I'd been watching lots of GMM at the time and it made sense, but I had this moment in my mind where I just laughed at the absurdity that my last thought in this life was going to be about two guys who do goofy things on the internet <laughs> smiling gently at me. And it made me feel better as everything went black. But I didn't die, I got to live. And the next day when I was trying to decide what it all meant, I thought, well, I am going to need a therapist, a program, and a third degree membership in the myth mythical society. <laughs> and uh, you comforted me when I thought I was dying and it seemed the least I could do. Wow. So that's what I did and it's going really well. And it feels good to be able to tell you and to thank you for your contribution to my life and millions of others. So thank you and uh, love you like a friend, fellas. Take care. I am so glad you're alive. Wow. Oh, I'm so man. glad that we could be there for that moment. I don't I don't remember it. Like I've established, I don't know how this all works. <sighs> I'm open to the fact that we um may have somehow like been transferred to your brain for a moment and just smiled at you peacefully. I don't know how it works, but glad I'm, you're okay. I mean, I'm honored. I'm honored to be the last I mean, we could have been the last thing that somebody thought of. But she thought it was, she you know, She got a laugh out got of it. Got a laugh out of going it. And going out with a laugh. That's good. And then coming back with a third degree mythical society membership. Yeah, I mean, yeah. what a great average. Can, can, right. can we can we just use that as a commercial? <laughs> you know? Yeah, we, we say, <laughs> we save lives. We, we appear to dying people. Bring them back so that uh, they can join the mythical society. <laughs> that is wild, man. I mean, and don't you feel honored? I feel, I feel so honored. It's like, you, her life is flashing before her eyes. We got and in there the, with the, the mom and the dog. The final slide of her life flash is us. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Man, that's wild. That is wild. So you, I mean, it feels like you got a little bit shaken up on this episode. I mean, it's just, I'll never watch that Netflix series. That's just not my type of thing. And I'm not gonna ever find myself reading accounts of people waking up during surgery. I'm sorry, but. Those feel like different things though, right? Because if I told you, the near death experience thing, of course, the waking up during surgery is just like a horrific thing, I get it. But the near death experience. There's a fascinating aspect to it. For me, it's just like, I've just, I've lived a life of just dismissing, all, and I still mostly dismiss all of it, right? I'm like, of course. You've got this perception, this perception network, you know, all your senses and everything. You've got this yeah. brain. Of course, I would be surprised if there were not stories like this as people approach death. As the system is shutting down, of course you're gonna see some weird stuff. Um, but if I could tell you that, like if I had one of these experiences and I was telling it to you, or like I'm just fascinated it would by carry it because some the you know it is a Netflix show. It's just a show. I don't know these people. It's obviously produced. It's obviously curated in a way to from a certain disposition. The whole point of the people behind this thing is to get you to believe it. You got to know that there's you you know there's some propaganda involved, and so you got to know when you're being subjected to that. But like, I don't you just want to know? Aren't you just fascinated by it? Uh 
I get that. It is the the, the what happens afterward, but like the like the I'm like when she's talking about like um the nightmarish parts of like being conscious but being un- unable to move. I know I'm not trying to go back to the surgery part of it, but like yeah, it's just like thinking of the ways that you die. That's it's um I'm fascinated by the afterlife part of it, but the actual death, the especially getting, the involved, getting there, is yeah. the problem. Yeah, but it's about the journey, man. <laughs> it's not the destination; it's the journey. I mean, am I going to appear to myself smiling? Well, along with you? Uh, well, no, it'll probably just be me. Okay, I mean, just be me sitting next. To you. I'll be in your periphery. You'll have to turn to see me, right? From your, you'll be on my your, right your, as your, usual. Your seat at the desk. Well, this is fine. I mean, the thing that I do like, I like hearing people tell their stories. It makes it believable. I mean, of course, I don't believe anything anybody said today, <laughs> but I almost do it's because made, I'm listening up. to their voice. One eight 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 earpod one. I have a wreck. Wreck it up. It is a TikTok account. Oh, I, I'm always looking for more TikToks. Uh, well, I recently shared one of the uh, TikToks from this particular account with a group thread that we're on. Oh, you t- you talking about the guy? I'm talking the, about with the beard VCR. Oh. Underscore party. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. VCR I, underscore party. I have party. found my love language and it is watching old footage. It turns out that this is the, okay, I mean. Not a lot of followers. You know, it's, I mean, it's not even a verified account, but it says official TikTok of found footage festival. Yeah, yeah, found footage festival, been going for many years. I knew about that, so I mean, I guess it is the official. Well, y'all need to get verified, come on now. So I don't know how the rights to this stuff work, but. Uh, I mean, the thing that is the most yeah. entertaining to me thus far, and I haven't dug deep, the thing that I sent the group is that dudes like, da- there's these dating profiles where people, these From dudes the 80s. would go on and they would like talk about themselves and apparently it would like go out on a videotape for women in the area to watch and figure out if they would like date these guys. And there's just this one guy and he is just the, he's the best. It's like, they don't make people like that anymore. Like, you know what I'm saying? I was like yeah. looking, not just his hair and the way he was dressed, but like, the way he talked and the way he moved his face and stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, he had a marionette quality to him. Just go, just go to the account and just start watching. It's either you're either going to love it or hate it. You know what I'm saying? Like either this is what you like or this is like why does anyone like this? It's a lot better than reading about all the other stuff Rhett's been reading about. Find out what kind of person you are. VCR underscore party on TikTok. Love it. All right. How's that get me scared? <laughs> I think I just choked for a second. Yeah, a little hot sauce packet? I choked on my thoughts. For me, the lyrics to the song Sledgehammer went totally over my head. I uh, I watched that video a million times because it was like a fun music video and I was a little kid. I don't know, six years old, seven years old when it came out. I watched it constantly. But like, open up your fruit cage and let me in. Like, wow, I had no idea. Hi, my name's Rachel. I'm a big fan. Um, so song lyrics that went over my head as a kid. My parents were musicians, so we always had music playing in the house. And I remember a couple of specific songs. Um, The song Hair of the Dog by Nazareth features a lyric, now you're messing with a son of a blank. And when I was apparently a small child, and my sister too, my sister and I would run around singing it in our squeaky little voices. (laughs) And dad loved to tell that story. Um, another time we were listening to, um, gosh, I forget the name of the song, but it's by Steely Dan. And the lyric is, the Cuervo gold, the fine Colombian makes tonight. I can't remember, but um, I asked my dad what Colombian meant. And it was a reference to drugs. Um, but he told me it's coffee, baby. <laughs> and he loved to tell that story too. Um, anyway, I'm a big fan of you guys. Thank you so much for doing what you do. Bye. Hey, Rhett and Link. My girlfriend, Sokata Desert Tortoise, and I are tanning out in the grass, and we just wanted to say one, eight, 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 one. <laughs> to watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.